Hi there, welcome back for part two of uh, Hi there, and welcome back to part two of Bacterial Diseases of the Digestive System. This is Lisa Schimmel of Crafton Hills College. Let's pick up our conversation with salmonella food poisoning, also known as salmonellosis. And this type of um, food poisoning is actually an infection. So if you'll recall, that means that you're going to eat um, food that actually contains live bacteria, in this case salmonella, and after the organism has sufficient time to colonize the lower GI tract, then we'll start to see an expression of symptoms. So we're gonna see a, a longer incubation period, but um, let's go ahead and back up and uh, follow your outline. All right, uh, so salmonella contaminated food, uh, typical culprits in, uh, include poultry and poultry products like eggs, um, other types of meat, uh, for example. Now, this is a situation where even if the food is contaminated, if it is thoroughly cooked and the bacteria um, are killed, then the food is safe to eat. I know that sounds a little bit gross, but um, it is uh, indeed to eat if properly cooked. Now, incubation time, as I said a moment ago, is going to be a bit longer. It can vary anywhere from 12 hours to two weeks. Now, 12 to 36 hours is typical, though. That's our average incubation period. Here's what's going to influence the length of incubation. How heavily contaminated with salmonella was the food when you ate it? And then how much of that contaminated food did you ingest? So if the food was heavily contaminated, then we're going to see a shorter incubation period. Um, if the food was perhaps only lightly contaminated or you only consumed a very small quantity of it, it could take as long as two weeks for the organism to have colonized your GI tract to the point where you begin to express symptoms. Symptoms include fever, nausea, abdominal pain and cramps, diarrhea, and vomiting as well. Uh, there is a low mortality rate, typically less than 1%. Occasionally, a patient will become septic, meaning the bacterium has actually entered their bloodstream. That most certainly could be fatal. Uh, recovery usually takes a few days. Now remember when we talked about staphylococcal food poisoning, usually we'd see a complete recovery in 24 hours, but this one might take a couple, three days. And once again, about the only thing we can do is replace fluids and electrolytes. So to prevent this, uh, make sure that um, chicken, poultry products, eggs, for example, are first of all properly stored and that they are handled properly. Uh, make sure that you use a different cutting board when you're uh, preparing chicken, that sort of thing. Uh, and that um, you don't consume products that contain raw eggs like homemade eggnogs and, and that sort of thing. Uh, okay, so once again, treating with um, replacement of fluids and electrolytes is what we've got to do. All right, next on my list is botulism. This is an example of an intoxication caused by Clostridium botulinum, gram-positive bacillus, forms endospores, and it's an obligate anaerobe. Now this organism is very common in nature, lives in soil and uh, also in the sediment of fresh water. This bacterium is a toxin producer as well. That's what we call, call this disease and intoxication. This one produces an exotoxin and it acts as a neurotoxin blocking the transmission of nerve impulses. That makes it difficult to do things like breathe and circulate blood and other things that we uh, just sort of take for granted. Now this fortunately is not a common condition uh, and the potent toxin, um, it's so strong that you only have to ingest um, an amount so tiny that it really wouldn't even stimulate an, an immune response. And um, there is no immunity to this particular disease. Uh, the toxin is not going to be formed in acidic foods. So what that means is, is that if the food has a pH of 4.6 or less, then it's not going to be susceptible to this kind of contamination. Uh, botulism cases are often associated with um, improperly prepared home canned foods, um, also home bottled honey, for example. Honey in general is not considered to be safe for infants, and often you'll hear cautions not to give infants or children less than a year of age honey 
because it could be contaminated with some spores and they could germinate in the child's uh, uh, GI tract and uh, they could actually form um, uh, the toxin and the child um, succumb to botul botulism. Sorry. Now, uh, this disease is also called sausage poisoning because it used to be, not so much anymore, used to be associated with uh, home prepared sausages. There are a number of different botulinum toxins, A, B, C, D, E, F, and G. Uh, and I'll talk about where we typically see those toxins in a few moments. So you ingest food that contains the botulinum toxin, and after about two days, you'll experience nausea, blurred vision, difficulty swallowing, and then a symptom called flaccid paralysis, and that refers to a, um, a, a loss of all muscle control, both voluntary and involuntary muscles. And this is um, obviously a life-threatening condition. Uh, the patient may experience cardiac or respiratory um, uh, failure. They're going to require hospitalization and assistance. And this um, flaccid paralysis, it can last for as long as one to 10 days. Now I wanted to mention what's known as infant botulism. They also call it um, floppy baby syndrome, seriously. And this is really the most common type of botulism that we see in the United States. Uh, possibly 80 to 100 cases a year uh, and due to ingestion of spores could be in honey could be in in dirt I mean you know children eat dirt certainly uh, the spores germinate in the um, intestines and produce the toxin there uh, and um, the child loses all muscle control all right now what types of botulinum toxin are we dealing with here type A that's the one that um, produces the most virulent form of the toxin, and you could literally die from simply tasting contaminated food. By the way, the food may have no perceptible change. It may not have a different odor or, um, or taste any different or look any different. Uh, now, without treatment, the type A botulinum toxin will see a mortality rate that ranges between 60 and 70 percent, and the type A endospores are the most heat-resistant variety. Type B, type B is seen in both the United States and in Europe, about a 25 percent mortality rate uh, without treatment, and then type E, that one is seen, um, it's associated with uh, seafood, and um, these endospores are the least heat resistant and they're usually destroyed by boiling uh, and uh, sometimes there'll be outbreaks of uh, botulinum type E that will cause a large die-off of waterfowl that eat um, contaminated um, mollusks for example. All right now um, types C and D those are the ones that we see most often in grazing animals like horses and cattle and even alpacas. As far as treatment goes, hospitalization of course for cardiac and respiratory support, antibiotics really aren't going to do much good for us here. What we're going to do instead is treat the patient with an, uh, an antitoxin, a botulinum antitoxin. And because we really don't have the luxury of time, uh, we don't really have time to figure out if they have A, B, or E, we're going to give them a combination uh, antitoxin that's going to cover all three varieties of the toxin. Now I wanted to mention some uh, medical uses of the botulinum toxin. Uh, first of all, in 1973, type A uh, botulinum toxin was first used to treat crossed eyes and uncontrollable blinking. Uh, it's uh, also been used to treat upper motor neuron syndrome in uh, individuals with cerebral palsy. Uh, it's effective, it's an effective treatment for excessive underarm sweating. And in 2010, FDA approved the use of botulinum toxin to treat chronic migraines. Uh, and small quantities of the toxin are going to be injected into the head and, uh, and the neck. And then of course, Botox used to um, relax muscles, facial muscles, and reduce the appearance of um, wrinkles on the face. Okay, let's go ahead and move on. Cholera is next, and this one is an example of a toxico infection caused by Vibrio cholerae, which is a gram-negative Vibrio. Uh, and this disease is acquired by ingestion, typically of fecal-contaminated water, 
and it's very rare in developed nations. Uh, it is still a, a large problem. Cholera is still a really big problem in underdeveloped nations where they either have insufficient uh, water treatment facilities or maybe none at all. Uh, and unfortunately, those nations make up a large percentage of the world's population. Uh, we occasionally will see cholera in the United States. Most of the time, it's uh, the result of someone who traveled abroad and brought home a new friend. Just to give you an idea of the uh, severity of the problem worldwide, it's estimated there are somewhere between three and five million cases of cholera a year, and somewhere between 100,000 and 120,000 deaths a year due to cholera. Now, um, incubation, 24 to 48 hours. Uh, now, 75% of infected people do not express symptoms, but they may shed the bacterium in their feces for anywhere from one to two weeks. When symptoms do occur, they are pretty darn serious. The organism colonizes the lower GI tract, begins to produce its toxin, and uh, this is going to begin with uh, severe diarrhea, which is, uh, believe it or not, going to become um, unbelievably severe. What I mean by that is, is that the patient is going to be losing enormous quantities of fluids and electrolytes from this diarrhea. And the diarrhea has its own special name. They refer to it as rice water stools because uh, tiny little flecks of the um, uh, epithelial lining of the intestines will actually be sloughed off and shed in the feces. Uh, so not very pleasant, but that's what they call it. The um, the major threat to the patient is the loss of water and electrolytes. And uh, you've got a diagram in your notes, let me see if I can find it here, of something called a cholera cot. All right, I seriously don't think you're gonna be able to see this, but um, you've got the outline in front of you. What we've got is a cot with a hole cut um, where the patient's um, behind would be placed, and then we're going to put a, uh, a large bucket underneath it to catch the diarrhea. I mean, that's, that's how severe their diarrhea is. As uh, far as treatment is concerned, if we uh, replace fluids and electrolytes, we're going to see an at least 80% survival rate. Uh, the patient may require up to 25 liters a day of an alkaline saline solution uh, it's going to contain bicarbonate and lactate, and we need to get it in the patient any way we can, orally, by IV, probably some combination of the, uh, of the two. Um, and um, without treatment, the mortality rate can be as high as, um, I just got confused, and so I'm going to um, rephrase that and say that with treatment, mortality is only about 1%. Sorry about that, guys. Okay, what do we have left? Next is shigellosis, um, or also known as bacillary dysentery, caused by um, a couple of different species of shigella, which is a gram-negative bacillus. Uh, shigella sonii, that causes about 70% of shigella cases in the United States, and uh, shigella dysenteriae, is uh, causing the more serious form of the disease, which is seen in um, mostly in tropical nations. All right, let's see, what do I wanna tell you? I think I already said gram-negative bacillus, uh, and um, this is going to occur upon ingestion of fecal contaminated food or water, and we're going to have incubation of about uh, 12 hours, and then the patient is going to initially experience um, abdominal cramps and diarrhea. Now, af, uh, excuse me, over the next one to four days, the disease is going to progress into dysentery, which of course is diarrhea plus blood and mucus. And this is, of course, a very serious condition, but it's not usually life threatening. And this is typically a self limiting infection. Uh, now, I wanted to mention that, um, again, fluids and electrolytes are going to be the treatment of choice. And this particular disease is associated with what we call the five F's of transmission. Uh, and those are food, fingers, feces, flies, and fomites. And uh, most often seen in, uh, in children less than 10 years of age. Okay guys, sorry um, that I didn't do a better job with this, but hopefully you got the information you needed. And I'll look forward to seeing you in class soon. Thanks for watching.